So I decided to come out today to St. Mary's Church here in Red Deer to talk to you guys about the significance of the tunnel and the white light that many people describe in near-death experiences. Here in the church, there's this beautiful skylight that the architects have built into the ceiling of St. Mary's Church, and they made this church and designed it so that it would resemble a cave, like the caves that our ancestors used to use in the ancient Paleolithic. And this is really significant because when we look at the experiences of people who enter altered states of consciousness or who endure near-death experiences, almost ubiquitously and consistently, they describe seeing a tunnel and a white light. So I want to talk to you guys today about exactly what that tunnel is and what people consistently say about the white light. Stay tuned. It's really interesting when we look at the descriptions that people give of these near-death experiences, how they consistently describe this tunnel and a white light at the end. In fact, this experience is so ubiquitous that it's become a part of popular culture. You then see that this area that you're in, uh, that you're passing through, takes the shape of a tunnel. And dimension-wise, it was, it was vast. It was anywhere from a thousand feet to a thousand miles wide and it was definitely to infinity and before you is this just magnificent beautiful bright white light and and in front of me if i had a front was this gigantic door and the door was 30 yards wide and 70 yards tall and it was a, the proverbial tunnel that people talk about was through this gateway I turned around and i was going into a tunnel and my mother, who had been dead for 15 years, was right at the tunnel. I can still see it. And you have a lot of, uh, you know, academics, atheists, skeptics, right, who try to suggest different theories, different explanations for these experiences. My favorite one is uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I once heard describe that, you know, when people are on an operating table, there's a big, you know, big light above them. And so he presented this as a kind of explanation for these near-death experiences. But frankly, it's a terrible explanation and it doesn't even fit with what the patients or the, or the first-hand reports of these experiences really describe. Everyone consistently tells the tale that the white light that they experience is much more than just a simple light. But this really brings up the question, why do we see these experiences so consistently? What is it about these experiences that is so constant throughout time, throughout culture and different societies? The next thing I knew, I was going down a tunnel. And there was such a sense of movement and speed. It was fast. Like I was, it was like a roller coaster. I was shooting down this tunnel, and and then I was on the other side. And I could see lights ahead of me, like a light at the end of the tunnel. I remember this very vividly going into it, uh, like a funnel or a tunnel, uh, like or a cylinder going upwards, uh, with all sorts of intense colors uh, and shapes and uh, just. It's, it's hard to describe as it's more of like a feeling, as a sensation, as like experiencing it, not just seeing it. I don't know. I was like shooting through like space time it, and like through all these tunnels and really fast. I couldn't see like it really anything in detail, just shooting through. And I know that I was moving, but it was fast, like light speed or faster. We really gain a significant insight when we start to look at Aboriginal and Paleolithic traditions, especially those which are conveyed through ancient rock art. In our lecture one and two series in Enlightened University, the, me and the students have went through this at length, talking about the importance of shamanism and the important role of altered states of consciousness in the earliest religious traditions from the ancient Paleolithic. And what we see when we look at the petroglyphs and the pictographs of those ancient prehistoric ancestors is that they consistently depict swirling vortexes, tunnels, experiences where in which they're moving through some kind of a tunnel, some kind of a vortex. And if you ask Aboriginal societies today to tell you what these images mean or what it is that they're trying to depict, they'll tell you that they are describing a tunnel that leads individuals into the spirit world. 
It's really interesting because when you look at the ethnographic literature and you study the traditions of especially First Nations people in the Americas, you find this belief system consistently wherever you go. In fact, many traditions hold that there would be a hole in the floor of the house that would be used as a ceremonial tunnel for entering the spirit world. Or if you ever have the chance to go to Arizona and visit the Grand Canyon, there's a small mound in the bottom of the valley with a hole in the top and it was believed by the Native Americans that this was in fact a pass passageway into the spirit world. Of course, physically, if you go there and you look at this place, it's solid rock, right? But what's important about this is that the First Nations people and in in Aboriginal societies, they understood that this was a consistent sign of one entering a spirit world or entering an altered state of consciousness, a visual kind of hallucination where in which you would see a tunnel of light or a tunnel moving through a certain kind of space. Now, this is exactly what people describe in near-death experiences, and what it appears to be is a, an experience of moving through or moving out of the dream-like nature of mind. I talked to you guys at length about the importance of the inner subjective experience of the mind as being almost like a reality unto itself. We understand, with the help of neuroscience and psychology, that the world we experience is not the immediate physical reality, but rather an, a reflection or a, an image or a simulation, you might even say, of that physical reality as it's constructed by our brains. This is why if you muddle with brain chemistry, you can experience things that are quote unquote, not there, right? This is the nature of a hallucinatory experience. But to the person who's subjectively experiencing these things for themselves, right? The experience is palpable and it's immediately real. And so when we look at these experiences and we study the testimonies of people who have entered these near-death experiences, what we're really observing are individuals who are entering the spirit world in the most ancient and, and archaic sense, because this is what we see going back all the way into the ancient Stone Age and the Paleolithic. These petroglyphs and pictographs of whirling vortexes carved onto the inside of cave walls, right? These are all indications of individuals entering the spirit world. In his book, The Way of the Shaman, uh, Michael Harner talks about this at length. In fact, he encourages his subjects to try and visualize that tunnel. And I can honestly say I've seen it more than once in my life, sometimes even during dreams or even when I'm just beginning to fall asleep. In fact, just the other night I had the experience of really getting close to falling asleep and sealing this whirling vortex all around me, right? But one of the things that's really interesting about this as well is that it is primarily a visual hallucination. People who are, uh, you might say, well anchored into the body, people who are healthy, will usually only experience this as a visual hallucination, maybe with some auditory elements, but physically, bodily, you will feel yourself stationary here on the ground. But what's interesting about near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences is that the people consistently describe feeling themselves lifted up and moving through this tunnel. So it's not just a visual or auditory hallucination, it's a full-fledged, full-body form of a hallucination. But here we have to be careful with using the word hallucination because oftentimes we use this word with negative connotations. You know, you say hallucination and people assume you mean not real, but in this context, that's simply not the case. These things are real, but they're real spiritually, not physically. You're not going to be able to weigh or measure or detect this tunnel with any scientific instrument man has because it is not a physical reality. It is something that's appropriate to the res cogitans, the nature of mind itself. But of course, when we talk about the tunnel that people describe and this experience of moving through a tunnel as one al enters an altered state of consciousness, we're really only talking about only half of the equation because just as consistently as people describe moving through the tunnel, they also describe seeing an enormous white light. And what I find really fascinating about this white light experience, right? Is that really, you know, when people experience this, they don't just simply describe it as nothing more than a white light. They don't say, oh, well, I just saw a luminous sphere, something like what we have here. They describe it as being the source of life and love and goodness and everything that brings joy. When you come into proximity with this light, it really is coming into proximity with the source of life, the source of consciousness, God, if you will. I did desire to become part of this light, um, including considering uh, my life in reality, the, the, the love that I have for 
my wife and children, uh, for the people around me, the um, wonderful things that I've been able to do in my life. I've had a really exciting and wonderful life um, prior to this experience. And the wonderful things that I can continue to do, uh, helping the people around me, making love uh, to my children and my wife and uh, close friends and so on. Um, but it was so much more desirable. Uh, this was perfection. This, this was heaven or God. In fact, I've even had the uh, privilege of talking to some people who've had dreams and visions and revelations and dreams. And they describe this where, you know, a good friend of mine, Jared, he said that he had a dream where in which he saw this white light. And then there were all these tendrils, like tentacles almost, coming off of the light and connecting to the back of everyone's head. And he said, as soon as those individuals died, that little tentacle, that tendril of light would disconnect and it would return to the light. So really, this is the most consistent element of all mystical experiences. In fact, we use the metaphor of light all the time when we talk about mysticism, coming into the light, becoming one with the light. In fact, mysticism itself is by definition an attempt to achieve union with the light, an attempt to achieve union with the divine. I really feel that I only properly understood the significance of the white light when I started to understand it through the lens of Tibetan Buddhism. Among the Tibetan Buddhists, they consistently describe this white light experience as an experience of the Dharmakaya, the mind of all the Buddhas, the primordial nature of mind that can never die, can never be lost, can never be stolen. It's eternal and everlasting. And this is a, a major element of the near-death experience, and it's consistent across all these different cultures, all these different people. But one thing I do want to say, and this is really significant and interesting, is that when we look at certain cultures, as for instance Hinduism, right, we don't consistently see a white light experience as often as we do in monotheistic societies, which I think is significant. Because when we look at a lot of the ancient cultures, you know, ancient traditional societies, pagan societies, they often do not describe their experience of death as a form of union with the divine or as a form of union with the white light. They more often and describe the afterlife as a kind of air-conditioned continuation of their present life. You know, I'm reminded of the Egyptians who hoped to achieve rest in the field of reeds, which really wasn't a paradise. It was just like their life in Egypt, but a little better, free of old age, disease, and all the inconveniences that come with material reality. Similarly, among Native Americans, we have the happy hunting grounds. I know the Blackfoot here in Alberta, they believe that the deceased would journey out to the sand hills on the east eastern end of Alberta, and this is where the souls would rest, but they would hunt, they would live, they would ride horses, they would continue to live an otherwise normal life. But when we look at monotheistic traditions, right, traditions from Europe and, and the Middle East and even the Buddhists, right, we see this consistent testimony of people seeing this white light, which I think is testimony to the power of these religious traditions. Even people who are not necessarily that particularly religious, but who are still exposed to the mythic forms and those mythic ideas, they seem to be influenced, they seem to be affected. I mean, not every American or European or Buddhist comes away from a near-death experience describing the white light. Some people describe, you know, hell realms and all sorts of different things. But it is remarkable how consistently we see the white light experience among people who come from certain cultures, certain religious backgrounds, which I think testifies to the effectiveness, the efficacy of those religious methods within the society. And so I'll leave you guys with a piece of advice. You know, the Buddhists, they talk about this experience of seeing the white light and they say, when you see the white light, what you really want to do is you want to become one with the light. But in order to achieve oneness with the light, one must let go of everything they're holding on to. All possessions, all notions of self, because this is ultimately the source of life. This is who and what you really are. You are the light. The light that is looking through your eyes and hearing through your ears is nothing less than the luminosity of the Dharmakaya itself. The white light shining in the void, shining in the darkness. And as the gospels say, and the darkness is never put it out. And so if you guys ever find yourselves in the presence of that light, I say send me a prayer. And as always, thanks for watching.